Good afternoon from a hot and sticky Austin, Texas. On behalf of the NMC, I'm delighted to welcome you to the NMC Beyond the Horizon. In this one, our discussion will explore a key theme found across multiple editions of the NMC Horizon Report series. New forms of teaching and learning require institutions to rethink how physical spaces are configured. Both formal and informal education settings are increasingly designed to support uh, more collaborative and project-based interactions with attention to greater mobility, flexibility, and multiple device usage. Today we're going to discuss projects from both the Higher Ed and Library Horizon reports. I'm your host today, Alex Freeman, Senior Director of Membership and Special Projects at the NMC. I'm joined by the NMC's Gordon Jackson and Brian Youngke. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions via the unified chat. I've seen you've, you've been able to find that and let us know you're coming from all over the place. For Florida, we got British Columbia, and other places in between. Uh, before we get started, a bit of logistics in this session. We encourage you to ask questions. Uh, we've, in some ways, flipped this program so that uh, the projects aren't new to you if you are familiar with the Horizon Report. Um, so you may have read a section on, on these, uh, these fabulous people and what they're doing at their uh, institutions and have a question uh, that probes a little deeper. So that's what we're here to do today. Um, so the unified chat is where you'll do that. We'll collect your questions throughout the session and weave them in as we can. Uh, also, if we are on socials, uh, so if you're on Twitter, uh, our hashtag for today's event is NMCHD. That's hashtag, that's waffle fry NMC cheese if you want to get silly about it. So we'll drop that into the, um, the unified chat so you can uh, join the conversation on Twitter. Uh, now on to the moderator of today's program, NMC Board Emeritus and current Chief Innovation Officer at the University of Texas here in Austin. He is joined by NMC members from North Carolina State University, Oregon State University, Purdue University, and the University of Oklahoma. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Phil. Well, thank you very much, Alex, and welcome, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce a, a stellar cast here who have uh, ex exciting projects in learning spaces um, from libraries to classrooms to um, uh, everything in between, really. Um, on our panel today, we have Philip Conrad from Purdue University, a Colleen Countryman from NCSU, John Dorbolo from OSU, from Oregon State University, and Carl Grant from the University of Oklahoma. I'm going to start um, with um, Colleen. Colleen, you're at NCSU, and NCSU for many of us is known um, by the work that Bob Beekner started years ago with Scale Up. That's right. And and I'd love to hear what uh, what new and uh, insightful at additions and enhancements that's uh, happened at NCSU in the uh, time that you've contributed. Sure, yeah. Um, I actually had the opportunity to be uh, Bob Beekner's PhD student um, as a grad student here, and so now I'm a teaching assistant professor, and I've been developing a series of labs using smartphone technology um, as a means of collecting data in the lab. So I worked with a group on North Carolina State's campus called the Delta Group, and together we actually developed our own free app that students can download, and it's called MyTech, um, and it's all one word, and so as you can hopefully maybe see on my screen, uh, students can actually get raw data from their smartphone, um, and as they move it, the, the graph will correspond um, uh, appropriately, and uh, so we're using these smartphones, students own personal smartphones to reduce some of the pedagogical barriers that they encounter with traditional equipment in the lab. And so it really challenges the idea of a traditional learning space in terms of what you think of as a physics lab because we're sort of removing the necessity of having traditional equipment and a traditional lab environment. And so we can take this technology outside or in students' dorm rooms or at the library and they can perform physics experiments in their everyday lives. So in a, in a sense, um, what you've done is enabled any space to become a physics experimental space um, and in that sense uh, leveraged um, the instrumentation that's inside the phone as your image there is, is demonstrating. W what are we seeing there? It looks like there's a, yeah. a cart on a, on a trail, a, a track. That's something. right. Yeah, exactly. So um, that is just some really inexpensive equipment that we had modeled in, in one of our machine shops. Um, it's a, just simply a wooden track with a, a very simple wooden cart and uh, we have rubber banded a student's smartphone to the cart and attached to one end of the cart you can see it's spring there. So what they're doing 
doing is they're actually um, pushing the cart up against uh, that that bumper at the end of the track, and so they're able to use the smartphone's internal sensors. There's one called the accelerometer, and they're able to uh, download all of the raw data from that. So they're able to determine exactly how much force the spring experienced as it pushed away from the bumper. In fact, uh, we actually asked students in a survey to report if they had used the smartphones at all outside of the uh, lab experience, and, and there what you're seeing there is just kind of a glimpse of what our curriculum looks like now. Um, and, uh, and we had several students say that they used it when they were skateboarding down a hill, when they were riding on the elevator up to their classroom, um, when they were just sort of swinging their arms around as they would normally while they're walking so they can kind of figure out how a, a pedometer might work and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, so students have now, uh, we've sort of broken this barrier and, and students are actually making stronger real world connections with what's going on in their daily lives. Um, maybe a little bit of audio for the rest of the audience. I know that was cutting in and out a bit for me, but um, may, I, may I just ask, um, in the context of, of implementation of this in, a, in the uh, campus con environment, are there um, AV implications to the kind of space that the students might be using this in, because I can imagine if you've got a large number of these devices going at once, um, perhaps depending on the uh, bandwidth that you're using and all like that, that might be an issue. Yeah, sure. So um, that is something that we do uh, try to counteract. Um, so our, our router systems in our physics labs right now are, are capable of holding um, certainly the number of students that we've had on there, so we haven't run into any connectivity issues. Um, but right now we're only requiring that one in every group of three students has a smartphone and is using it um, during ah. the lab. Um, and it, in addition, uh, we actually don't need them in most of the labs. We don't require them to uh, email the data to themselves or anything like that. A lot of the data analysis occurs right on the phone locally. So, um, so oftentimes a network connection isn't even required, which is kind of nice. Also. Got it. Got it. And so you have a, a looks like a, a smartphone in this image that you're showing mm -hmm. now um, uh, on a on a table of some sort, or perhaps right. I'd say. Um, a, a, a scale. Yep, exactly. Yeah, that is actually a, a turntable. Um, so that that circular component on top there rotates freely, and so uh -huh. um, in that lab, what we're doing is we put the smartphone on that freely rotating turntable, and we use the internal gyroscope to measure how much the phone is rotating or how quickly the phone is rotating. Um, and so students can actually determine what that hanging mass is um, on on the side of the pulley there that's just hanging off the table there, um, and so they can you know, basically use the rotational velocity of the smartphone to determine how much mass is there. Aha, uh -huh. so we have ro rotational motion and who knows what else. And uh, linear motion, yeah, exactly. momentum that might be involved, etc. That's right. Um, so is there any particular uh, advice that you would give to someone who is looking to implement this kind of uh, technology in their learning space? You're, you're assuming that the students are bringing their phones. You don't have to store them or anything like that. You don't have any of those logistical issues. Right. But are there anything else that you would suggest if you're thinking about a space that you would want to see it set up to maximally enable it? Oh, that's an interesting question. One of the things that um, we do have, one of the other projects that has been going on in the, the physics education research group here uh, by one of my colleagues, Will Sands, is a series of kit labs where students actually go to a library during their lab time and they pick up um, a, a kit there full of the equipment that they need. And um, one of the unique things about that project is that it's um, that it is actually synchronous. Um, so a TA is available over Skype effect and so they're able to give them just as much aid as they would be able to in a traditional laboratory environment. So yeah, like you said, there are some logistical complications. You know, while the smartphone is incredibly capable, they do still need things like carts and tracks and springs and, you know, some really basic physics equipment. So just making sure that those sorts of things are available to students, however you decide to do that. That I see Great. is sort of Well, thank you. Um, uh, Colleen, I think it's it sounds to me like that's a really nice way to be able to bring the classroom and the experiments in the classroom to spaces other than you might traditionally use, as well as being able to take a regular classroom and, and repurpose it for um, physics that you otherwise might not be designed to do initially. Excellent. Let me turn 
let me turn to Phil and see if your microphone is there. Are you there, Phil Conrad? Yeah, I'm back. Can you guys hear me any better? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, Sounds great, perfect. Great. So, t so you're at Purdue, right? Yes, at Purdue and, University. And so tell me a little bit about the, the kind of learning space that you've put together for the students at Purdue. Okay. Our division serves graduate level students uh, taking courses in engineering. We have six, I believe, degree programs that students can earn completely online and those would be like industrial engineering, mechanical engineering and um, several others. We recently brought on uh, computer science as well. So these are all pretty much 500 uh, level and 600 level courses. We have these facilities that we that we designed so we have the on-campus students come to these these uh, studio classrooms and then we we have a, a set of distance students that attend the classes as well. Now most of our distance students are working professionals so they don't necessarily have time to attend the lecture live. So they'll, they'll watch the lecture in the evenings when they're at home or perhaps over lunch. And the way we have these rooms set up here as you can see is uh, the instructor will, will sit up front of course and they the instructor has a monitor in the back and they can see whatever goes on that screen will be what will be produced out to the uh, distant students. So everything's just recorded live, like I said, and, and students can, they do have the option to, uh, to attend the course live. And we have a, a student operator who will work for us, and you can see in the, in the, on, this, on this picture here, in the back on the left, there's a, there's a window, and that's a control booth we have in each of our three, three rooms that we use for this purpose and the student operator will sit back there and run the, the controls. So they, they'll run the audio uh, for the instructor and they'll, they'll switch the, the input sources. So for example, we'll start with a shot of the, of the professor on, on camera and then they'll, after a minute or two of announcements and some housekeeping items, they'll, they'll switch to the PowerPoint presentation. Um, we also have a document camera on the, on the front lectern that instructors can use. So uh, you can see here too that we don't have a whiteboard. So everything's done from from the the devices that are on the um, lectern. In addition, so we'll so like I was saying, we'll have, we'll have a student operator switch the inputs. So that if they're on the PowerPoint or switch over to the document camera or whatever, so the instructor doesn't have to worry about that. We um, again also have HDMI, VGA available, so if instructors have their own devices they want to bring in, like a, a Windows Surface or, or a MacBook or whatever, they can do that as well. Um, because, yeah. So tell me if, if you, they, you have the, control, the person in the control room, is there multiple classrooms that individual is controlling or is their primary focus the one that we're seeing? So each, each, uh, each classroom has, has one control booth, and okay. the student, so the student just controls the one, the one class in that, in that room. Yes. Right. And I notice you have microphones hanging from the ceiling. That audio receptivity or audio capture is often one of the challenges of a space like this. Um, are those hanging mics what you've currently uh, focused on as, as the most useful, or are you still searching? We are still searching. In fact, in 15 minutes, we have another test for some some other equipment that we're testing for that that very purpose, uh, there's a there's a new product that we're that we that we um, came across and we're we're testing it to see if it's something that that we would like it to you know to, to re replace these microphones actually, they they work okay. Uh, these these are the, the ones that you see in the and that you saw in the picture are are Vadio microphones that hang down and we still have issues in trying to capture. Especially like if a student asks a question, we have a little bit of an issue trying to capture the first couple words uh, to, to get the audio you know, level set really well. Uh, so we, are, we have been exploring um, some other options. One option we explored last semester was a, a, a tool called Catchbox. And it's basically just a foam box that can be passed around. Basically a handheld microphone is what it is. And one of our instructors used that for his, uh, for his course and it seemed to work really pretty well, um, so that was that was a, that was a nice a nice deal. So we still have that, and so. So you have a good we'll, fallback if you want it. We do, yeah. So if you were to give some advice to someone who was putting this kind of environment together, um, are there particular elements of it that are more sensitive in terms of the overall student experience than others? 
Well, definitely the the audio is is a really pretty big deal. It's it's something that we've improved on over the over the past several, several years. We used to actually have have microphones on the tables um, in the old our old facility, and, mm -hmm. and again that worked okay, um, but not. And I think these ceiling microphones work work better, but we're still trying to find a solution. That's also like a ceiling microphone array uh, to to resolve that issue. So, so right. because so that's good. Uh, Any issues with respect to sight lines or um, so the number of reference monitors available or their size or things like that 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 um, have become um, at least from the students' perspective things that you want to pay particular attention to. Um, I think just the size of the room is is always um, a key to, to to think through because. In addition to the distance students, we also have to th consider the the on-campus enrollments, and some classes obviously are, are bigger than others. And if the bigger, the more space you have, the more flexibility you have to offer more uh, more classes, um, mm -hmm. as you know, as classes are, are bigger. Um, proximity, I actually with our, our office and our like our production control area that kind of has that the kind that controls it has all the guts, I guess, of the of our operations um, is it's helpful to have to be close to the student workers to to respond to issues that may come up so our staff is after we do some training yeah our staff is close by to, to help with issues that that may come up as well so a couple of those right. things are yeah, it looks pretty it looks pretty spacious in terms of square feet per student in that in that environment quite frankly yeah, um, yeah it's, it's pretty so nice. it looks like you're a little bit luxurious and I also notice you've got the uh, sound dampening on this on the front walls we do. Um, so you mm -hmm. paid attention to some of the the, the echo or uh, flutter that typically uh, plagues those kinds of spaces. Yeah, the acoustic panels were one thing that we, we considered in the original right, design. So, so yeah. So let me turn now to John Darbelow at uh, Oregon State. Uh, John, you've got one of the more interesting spaces in terms of um, geographic layout. Um, and it's also a space that um, you've got a number of different ones of, of varying sizes. So you have um, a, a nice kind of uh, interesting mix. So why don't you describe um, the learning in the round that you've been in, uh, exploring with? Thanks, Phil. Um, yeah, we, uh, we were challenged with um, rapidly growing uh, enrollments, um, going up to 35,000 students by, you know, in, in 10 years. So and we were already a, a shortage of... Um, uh, uh, classroom space and places for students to study. So we decided to build a new classroom building. It's four stories, 17 classrooms. It'll hold about 2,200 students at a you know at a clip. Um, and the, the surprise for us was uh, the faculty-led process, which led us to build round rooms. We we have studio classrooms. We have active learning spaces. We have collaborative classrooms all across campus. But lecture is not going away. There is the need for large lecture. So what we're seeing now is the large arena room, which is 600 seats. Um, the, it's completely in the round. There's a 360-degree projection of dual projection, um, and uh, the acoustics are excellent. Um, and what's, what's really unique about this is that you are eight rows away from the furthest student. Uh, part of this came from the study of proxemics, Edward Hall's anthropological work on personal space and social space and public space and the majority of the students are within the social space of that of 12 feet um, and then then uh, the close public space for the ones at the very ends so you can that's see even, go ahead. that's even at the largest the largest rooms where we're looking at for example at the large room we have a note one next to it that's 400 seats instead of right. 600 and I can't see the people in the back row uh, and th this is the 300 seat room in the round um, and it's so intimate, uh, I just, you just walk right up to the people in, in, in a second. Um, then there's another, which is 180. It's an it's a oval shape like this. And it's a very mm -hmm. interesting space for producing um, a discussion. Um, and this, this is a very interactive space with the similar design. Interesting. In the large space, I noticed that the ceiling is, is sort of open to the mechanics of the building. Right. Um, in the other spaces, they're clearly finished in some particular fashion. Was, is, is there a reason for that, or is that just the way the the, the, the way it planned out? The two smaller spaces um, uh, have uh, natural light, 
in them. So you there's windows uh, in and in, in there, and, and you could put down. I think that there's the shutters are down now, but you you can let in natural light. The large mm -hmm. arena room doesn't have that, and so you're seeing a lot of lighting, um, you know, up there and the infrastructure of the room. Got it. Got it. So one of the things that's interesting is that it, it almost sounds like this space could be cavernous, right? I mean, the look of it kind of makes it, um, uh, you, in first glance, is sort of a, uh, a um, almost a, an athletic facility in some sense. Um, but it, but from what I gather with in uh, talking with you previously and reading some of the stuff you've done, the the sound actually. Um, carries in a way that's actually quite surprising. Uh, students from one side of the room and actually hear people talking in normal mm -hmm. voice on the other side of the room, which can be a bit surprising. Yeah, that's right. The instructors do use mic microphone, but uh, those screens that you can see, it forms like a cone. And the way that the architects, it's Bora Architects in Portland, designed this was so the sound would reflect back. So it, it reflects back to the other side, and um, it creates such a crisp, clear sound that when they take exams, the students complain they can hear each other's pencils scratching. So we, we have to think about that. <laughs> well, that's an unintended side effect that perhaps is uh, um, something people have to get used to, I suppose. Is there anything about this that you ran into that was um, surprising in, in, in terms of the outcome of it or, um, or something that you would, if somebody else had the, the um, um, interest in trying to replicate this in some form on their campus, you would want them to pay special attention to. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, I, uh, first of all, I just have to say we had no idea whether this would work. We couldn't find another instance of round rooms. Um, and so it was built uh, so that we could take it apart and make it into two square rooms if we had to. Um, that didn't happen. We've, we've had this up for a year now, since last fall. Um, and we went through a lot of process like um, these mock-up sessions that we would do where uh, we would actually replicate the size of the, the room in a ballroom um, and have people give mini lectures to see how it went. Um, instructors uh, need um, assistance in, in finding their way into that space. Everybody is taken aback in the beginning. Now there are several veteran lecture instructors that are really good at what they do. Uh, who will not give it up. They say, I will not go back to the rectangle room, no matter what. Um, there are some that get in there, and they're just not comfortable. And what I have found is that those who have had some kind of movement background, dance or something like that, athletics, are very comfortable in this space. And people who are, are more conscious about their movement feel more anxious. So we're getting the uh, theater department involved. Um, uh, Charlotte Hendricks did her dissertation on uh, theater in the round and we want to try to train people through theater and also the dance department to help us get movement class going so that you use the space gracefully. Interesting. So in, in some sense, um, in at this point, the three different presentation, Colleen's, the instructor will probably need some um, some training or at least some orientation to how to use the device well and set up experiments to do the work and take most advantage of that. And in the case uh, of Phil in uh, at Purdue, um, that's in some sense a little bit more traditional distance learning uh, uh, format, but still it takes attention to uh, teaching in that in that mode so that you engage the external audience or at least uh, bring them in where you can and in your case you're on stage um, and so you have the, the sort of ergonomic aspects of, um, of body movement and such paying attention to the people around you and so in some sense all three of the areas that we've seen so far um, have to have or at least would benefit from that kind of attention and there's a nice graphic of the actual layout yeah, and I would like to say, yes, what would I, I suggest for people that would want to prepare, um, come visit us. Uh, we would love to show you the space, uh, even if it was virtually. But, but, but if you could come here and actually experience the space during a class, um, it, it, it changes everything. Washington State University is building one of these in Pullman. And, and they came here while the building was being constructed and, and it came back um, to see it in action. And so uh, I, I think ha actually experiencing it for yourself can give you a real sense of uh, how it would work.
Excellent. Any particular um, last uh, words that you, of wisdom that you would uh, give? I, mean, I noticed that when you described initially the planning of this, um, you gave yourself an out in a sense in that the round spaces were in fact in, a, uh, in an enclosed area that you could re revert to something more traditional if it turned out um, that that was, uh, if it, for whatever reason it didn't work. Uh, Fortunately, it did, but is that something you would consider as a piece of advice to others if they had that opportunity? Well, it, it, I think once the concept has been validated, then people can move forward with confidence. We just didn't have anything to base it on. <clears throat> but right. it's more than just anecdotal evidence in some informal surveys. We have a, a, a agenda of formal research going forward called the geometry of learning which is uh, studying about 60 different course classes over uh, five terms we'll probably have about 10,000 students in that study and we're measuring where they sit and what their grades are and correlate all of that we're measuring sound and light and distance and angle of vision to the screen and to the instructor and we're going to correlate all of this information together as well as qualitative surveys so uh, if, if wisdom's to be had, it's going to be once I get these results together and we can get some publication out there to show folks what this means, you know, quantitatively and qualitatively, you know, with good research. Right. So right. that's what. So the, the 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 advice is if someone wants to do this, get an air uh, an airline fare and, and head to Oregon to take a look at it. Give me a call. <laughs> yeah, drop me a line. Sorry, sorry okay. to interrupt. We we do have a question before we move on. Uh, from oh, okay. the audience. Yeah, it's from yeah, Lori Mumpower. I'd like to hear more about how faculty found ways to use the room and other unique learning spaces effectively. Did you work with a teaching and learning center, for example? Yeah, we're, uh, my unit is academic technology, and so uh, and and we're correlated with the um, teaching and learning center right here. Right, they're right next door to me. So uh, we put on seminars over the summer and uh, in between each term for new instructors coming into all of the spaces in this building to acquaint them with the technology and also give them a chance to practice um, on stage. Uh, and uh, I even took some of them to classes in action so that they could get a sense of, of how it went. Um, it's, there's, there's very creative uses. Um, uh, one of the instructors uh, treats the round room as coordinates, and so she would go off to a certain uh, area and say, you're, you're coordinate A, and they're coordinate B, and that she has them do different things. And even then they're, they're in their seats and not getting up and moving around, it still makes it an active learning type of pedagogy. So there are many ways to use uh, even a large space um, creatively and constructively. Did that answer your question, Lori? I'd be glad to connect you up with some faculty that have been teaching in these spaces and you could, you know, get some more ideas from them. Alex, are there other questions that, that we need to address? I'm not seeing the, the overall chat. Okay. So let me then turn, if that's all right, to, um, to Carl. Um, and you're um, in a library space. And Carl, tell us a little bit about what the University of Oklahoma has done to take the traditional uh, library study space and turn it into something a little bit more dynamic. Indeed, thank you. Uh, when the university hired a new dean for libraries about four years ago, they brought in uh, Rick Luce, who was formerly at Emory in Los Alamos, and he brought along a vision for the library which said we need to be the intellectual crossroads, the place where ideas from the colleges intersect, bounce off of each other, and, and hopefully improve as a result. And so part of what we really needed to put into place here was a very clear collaboration space. And this was a very traditional library, very traditional spaces. And we took a, a whole floor that was devoted to serials and, and periodicals uh, and monographs and microfilms, um, and we cleared it out. And we redid that space, calling it the uh, Helmrich Learning Collaborative Space. And the, uh, the space is designed to be very flowing in its nature. You can, you can see here it's open. Uh, the furniture is all movable for the most part. You're seeing the help desk right there in the middle, but the uh, furniture around it is uh, all movable. The students can bring it together. A lot of this uh, surface that you can see is writable. They can take markers and write on the tabletops and, and on a lot of the glass screens. Um, and we knew that well, talking to the students, we've done a lot of surveys before we actually plunged into this, that wanted collaboration space. They wanted to work together. They, you know, and this, the library had the rather traditional single desk uh, study cubes all over the place. And so this was a radical change 
And we brought into the space both the, the help desk that you saw there in the first picture, uh, which is staffed both by campus IT and by uh, the library, so that whether you're having a technology problem or whether you're having a, a knowledge problem, somebody's there to help you. And it's uh, done in the roundtable format because we wanted people to understand and see librarians as collaborators, not in a service mode. So it was a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder kind of approach that we wanted to take there. Uh, we have group study rooms. You can see those down at the far end. There's four on each end, so a total of eight that the students can book via the web or via Crestron controllers right on the door frame uh, and reserve the space. Uh, we ask, of course, that take two or more students to do that. We have a uh, series of post-edit workstations. You can see way down there at the far end, there are recording studios for both the students and the faculty where they can record videos or seminars or their lectures, whatever is appropriate. And they can use those stations down at the end to do post-editing on their uh, videos. We also have a, a collaborative learning classroom, uh, which is in one of these pictures. That's the community room. Uh, keep going. There it is. Um, the collaborative learning classroom with, of course, the podium in the middle where the instructor can then direct output to any of these numerous screens that are all around the room or he can put his or her output on all of those screens or have each table project to an individual display. Uh, so these are, this is a really super collaborative space, and they, they really seem to, um, to appreciate it. The challenge we've had with that space is just making sure the professors didn't try and book it for every one of their classes because we have this space to, to serve the entire campus. Um, the collaborative learning commons was really a test of an idea. We believe that the students, the faculty would all want more of this kind of space. And so it was the first area that we did on the campus to show that we, we were onto the right idea here. And as a consequence, we're now going to be redoing uh, large parts of the library using similar format. Uh, this one was a little more concentrated in the technology side uh, because it was the proof of concept space, whereas if we were do, as we do this through the rest of the library, there'll be a better blending of traditional library resources and this kind of collaborative space, but this is pretty much dedicated to, to the furniture and the, and the collaboration. So in the planning process, um, you've got a couple of different, uh, well, you've got several different uh, types of spaces in this, in this environment, and in fact, at least the, uh, the first one we saw um, looks like it could morph into something, that's the one, that you could morph that into something almost um, social on Friday nights um, if you wanted to bring in um, someone to give a talk or someone or, or even something more uh, ad hoc than that. I know at the Science Library at the University of Chicago, for example, they actually bring in jazz quartets in the, in the Friday evenings and turn the place into a, into a little club. Um, in the science library, but it sounds like that you have that option. What sorts of pre preliminary um, inquiries did you do f of your community, of your students, perhaps, and faculty that um, shaped the primary uses that, that we see? Uh, uh, we did a number of meetings, uh, both with faculty and students, to, to get their input on what we were thinking of doing. Uh, the community room that you saw in there where we had the large screen, that's actually right next to the coffee shop. And so we open that space up when it's not being booked for another event. And that allows the students to flow in there, for instance, on a Friday evening. Um, and it's very popular, yes, that, that space there. The other space out in front that you were talking about, we just let the students reconfigure the furniture as they see necessary. So as larger groups get together, they just drag the chairs across the floor and reconfigure it as they need. But in talking with uh, both students and faculty, one of the other places that we did create is a digital scholarship laboratory, which is directly across from this community room. And that's dedicated to just graduates and faculty, uh, graduates, postgraduate students. Um, and they have a space there that's a little more defined just for them. Students are not allowed into that space. Has again a number of areas that they can book uh, and, and meet. It has a conference room with a privacy screen on it. Uh, we have a recording studio for the faculty in there that they can use to record classes and, and all of that. Uh, so that has been so successful that as we're now moving down one floor, I'm going to remodel that space and it'll be 
dedicated purely to faculty and grad students. And uh, it will be a little more traditional. Of course, faculty aren't as interested in some of the technology as the students are. Uh, but uh, it's been, been uh, warmly received as a result of this space being successful on the campus. So we, we have a question from the audience, um, which actually applies to all of you. So I, I'll, I'll start with, with you, um, Carl, but uh, I'll ask each of you to chime in after Carl is done. Because the question is really one of about uh, metrics and assessment. Now, um, John, you talked a little bit um, uh, in depth about the, uh, the research project that you're going on in, in, in at Oregon, St uh, Oregon State, but in the in the space of the the environment that you were just describing, Carl, um, what metrics are you actually looking for, or are you collecting at this point, um, to tell you something about um, whatever you're defining success to be? Um, you've got some that are presumably qualitative, you've got some presumably quantitative, and are there particular um, metrics that are more um, based on the actual outcomes of students' interactions with the space as opposed to simply uh, inputs about the um, number of people who actually walk in the room and things like that? Yeah, well, we, we have largely had to start with the body counts, which, of course, have been exceedingly hard. Uh, even at 2 a.m. in the morning when the library closes, uh, there's about 200 students in that space. It'll hold about... Uh, 1,500, but, but at 2 a.m. in the morning, we still have to push 200 of them out, out the front door because they, they would love having access one o'clock. We do regular counts, of course, but what we're looking for is more what you're asking for, the kind of impact that we're seeing. And it takes a little while when you spin up a new facility like this. There's a lot of marketing. Uh, that would be clearly one of the lessons learned that came out of this was you really do have to spend some time educating your faculty, inviting them into the space to get them to see it and engage with it. Uh, it was not uncommon in the first couple of months to have faculty show up and say, well, I came to see this because my students told me I had to come and see it. You know, they, they were doing <laughs> that, but it wasn't until the students were telling the faculty, wow, you got to go see this new space. And I think I sent a picture of the, of the whiteboard that we put up, I, I don't know if you have that at hand, that showed the kind of comments the students were giving us about the space. And it was overwhelmingly acceptive in promoting the space and its usage. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's a one shot I sent that was just of a whiteboard, that one. Um, and, you know, the kids were just in love with it. Um, I walked I walked down the hall the very first uh, day we opened it, and I heard one student turn to the other one and say, we're not in Oklahoma anymore. Um, <laughs> um, of course, one of our biggest uh, plus moments was when we had a faculty member who was terribly critical of us emptying the space of the cereals and the microforms. Uh, he came in on the first day and saw the space totally full. And uh, God bless the man. He walked over to us and said, I was wrong. You were right. Um, again, very nice to hear because you'd really taken us to task on it. So in, the other things we're looking for is how are the faculty incorporating the spaces in their classroom programs or and the use of the community space for lectures and seminars from across the university. Of course, we can fill it with library programs, but we've really encouraged and reached out to the faculty and the heads across the campus to say, this is community space. We want you to use it. And so we've monitored very closely the usage of the space by other divisions, other colleges on the campus. Uh, and of course, we're always monitoring the attendance at those events to see are those events pulling in crowds. Uh, and doing surveys afterwards, we've got Qualtrics, of course, and we've, we've tried to do a, a lot of surveys, get input data back. Um, and again, all very positive, very large numbers. I won't sit here and bore you with the exact stats, but is is very popular space and has motivated the president of the university to uh, encourage us to proceed on with our remodeling of all the floors. Got it. So let me just turn back to um, to both uh, Phil and, and uh, Colleen for a second, and then I'm going to uh, have a question for John. But in terms of metrics for success of the various um, uh, implementations that you've been responsible for. So, uh, Phil, let me start with you. Um, are there particular uh, demand metrics? Or is, is the room being used in a wider context than perhaps it had been before, or are, is the um, utilization 
uh, rates across time in some sense different than you've had in, in previous incarnations of these uh, distance classrooms? We um, we get a lot of requests for, for pe from people to use our rooms, our facilities. However, we are so full during the semesters that it's just not too feasible to, to do that. There is a, another organization on campus that uses it on the weekends for their weekend master's program, and that that's it's been successful uh, with that as well. So one of the things that, that we actually did was was try to do some future proofing with our rooms. So for example, if we wanted to add add more cameras in the room or or change out, we have a couple of our, of our rooms use use screens and projectors instead of like the 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 TV monitors. Uh, if we were to sw switch to the TV monitors in those rooms, just some of those things, uh, that mm -hmm. was that was important to us to include as well. Uh, we also, as far as like metrics and stuff goes, we we do look at learner performance. One of the things that we found uh, last last semester was that the the our distance student population actually performed overall. They performed pretty much right at or 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 better than the students that were on campus taking the the classes live, so that was really interesting to, to see. And then we do surveys uh, at the start of the semester. We do surveys to see how things are working with our, our technology, and how how things are going from students' uh, point of view in that aspect. And we get a lot of feedback regarding um, audio, if it's if it's going well or not, and video and all that all that good stuff. Um, how soon the classes are available, which we are able to get our, our lectures up within about. 30 minutes or so from the time the lecture ends. So, really want to see what what students are are um, are looking out for. Got it, Colleen. What about in your case, in terms of metrics for success of this method of using space across the campus as well as particular rooms? Sure. So, um, so we have a, a number of uh, assessments that we use to determine the impact that the app has on students, but to specifically address what you're referring to, which is um, sort of geographic usage data, we actually um, employ the Google Analytics. Um, so we've connected in our, in our mobile app design, we've actually linked up every button that students are able to push with effectively like a message that gets sent to Google where we can then uh, view what they're doing. And so we can actually see how they're navigating through the app, but also where geographically they're located and some really basic demographic information as well so we can determine, um, you know, where they're using it. So we, we don't have such fine green detail that we can uh, differentiate, for example, the lab building from their dorm, but we can say if they're using the app on campus or off campus and things like that. So um, that's proven really valuable in terms of determining how much they're using the devices outside of class. Right, right. Okay. So let me then turn to John, um, and I've got two questions. One is the metrics question. You've talked a little bit of that, about that already. Uh, but in particular, uh, there was a question from the audience about um, the usage of the space over time. Sort of, you know, you build a building like this with this kind of um, expense and, and the like, um, and you start to wonder, it, it, how can you use it across the 24-hour cycle? So after classes, do you find students come in and use it um, to, as a study space or as a group space, um, perhaps not intended even in the big room, but it may be that it's simply conducive and pleasant enough to make that something that people are naturally attracted to. So tell us a little bit about its use across time as well as um, some of the more formal metrics on a space basis that you're, uh, that you're measuring. That's a good question, Phil. Um, it was a, a, a deliberate part of the building design to maximize the, uh, uh, the opportunities for students to have study spaces. Um, I, I said in the beginning that uh, just classroom space was at a premium. We didn't have enough of it. Um, and uh, but we all students would tell us consistently we don't have places to study. They fill the library, they fill the Memorial Union, um, and, and they had no place. So the interesting design of this building is most buildings you go into, the classrooms are on the outside, and there's a hall in the middle, and the students sit in the hall waiting for their next class. Um, this one, the classrooms are all in the center of the building, and there's so there's these uh, uh, perimeters for four floors. Uh, that allow for very spacious, about 650 individual study spaces. And they're of all kinds. There's, there's technology-enabled versions of that. There's weird couches. There's closable rooms, a whole bunch. And so, um, I, I mean, I live in this building. So I, I see students in here all of the time. We haven't gone 24-7. Um, I'm on a campaign to get us there. 
Uh, we need to staff it to do it, but so what? We should just do that. Um, to me, uh, an answer kind of to your question, uh, maybe, and, and the metrics thing too, this is, I've been here for 30 years. This is the only t pl time I've ever seen students bringing their families to a classroom. <laughs> we had Mother's Day and Father's Day and these other events, and the students will come and bring their family just to show off the big round room. Um, and, and, and to me, that's mind blowing. And and then sometimes the door is locked, and I, I'm like, this is crazy. We, you have to let people in. Um, so I don't know. I don't. Do y'all? Do I mean, I could see some of the classrooms that you were showing, Phil and um, uh, Carl, that that st students would you know, bring their families to those too. But, but to me, that's a sign of success. So if you get on the campus tour list um, for visiting uh, prospective students and their parents, you know you've made a successful implementation, it sounds like. So, and that's, uh, that's a, a good notice, a good notification. Um, what's actually happened here in Oklahoma, we used to not be on the campus tour. They'd walk by the front door of the library. Now they regularly bring them all the way through the CLC. Okay, so that maybe that is one of the um, the metrics that one has for a for a large scale renovation or a, or a greenfield it's build. A problem. We have so many tours every day <laughs> that we actually have complaints about the noise level in the CLC. Fair enough. Fair enough. And um, so let me let me just ask the group in general then. Um, You've all gone through some relatively major engagements. You've had to deal with how you introduce these spaces um, to the faculty. You've had to deal with um, the um, logistics of um, the students' reconfiguration of these spaces. And in the case of Oklahoma, you just let them reconfigure it at sort of that will, it seems, for one of the areas. Um, in, a, in a general sense, is there... Um, um, anything that one needs to kind of have one's uh, antenna out for about um, about the um, introduction of this space or these spaces um, to the community? Are there particular, um, you know, proactive, I mean, you can send your announcements out saying, please come visit us and such, um, but are there particular steps that you have found more effective um, to not only introduce the space, but to introduce the faculty uh, to the space? And I suppose to some extent, um, the the personal introduction and asking someone to come by and, and sitting down and showing them on, on a one-on-one -on -one basis is is perhaps um, a really effective and continues to be one of the gold standard ways of doing that. But are there other uh, uh, sec uh, hints about how you do that introduction of the space to the community that you would um, point out that aren't necessarily as obvious? Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if they're okay. obvious, but you know, of course, when you're removing uh, traditional materials from a library, you really have to work with the faculty. And I don't know about you all, but I find sending emails out to faculty is a is a very frustrating way of trying to communicate with them. So you have to try and get slots on their department meetings in order to get out there in front of them and talk to them. I've actually had faculty say to me, if uh, an email comes from an administrator or a dean or associate dean, I just delete it. You know? So it's like, okay, great. Um, you know, we're trying to inform you, but you won't invite us. We've scheduled a lot of events in the space to make sure that they were welcome to come. We, we gave tours purely for faculty. It took a lot of time and effort to orchestrate repeated engagement occasions. Uh, in well, the not, and it sounds like you actually used perhaps the most effective method, which is um, you had your students um, uh, in, a, in a, an underground <laughs> method of, uh, of bringing it to their attention so that it was, uh, it was something that they felt they needed to see in order to stay in good graces with their own classes. Is that uh, a similar pro issue that you've encountered at Purdue? Do you have to go out and market this? You said the space was in, in heavily used as it is, so in a programmatic sense, it sounds like it's an essential cog in the uh, in the pedagogical delivery of of the campus. And so, uh, one might assume that that you have little in the way of marketing needs. In fact, if anything, you're fending them off. That's that's pretty much the case. We we do have faculty orientations ahead of every semester, so especially for the the new faculty. It, it really helps them to to get orientated to the room and, and see how how things work. Which it's not too much different than most classrooms on campus, which is, is part of our goal. But but there are a little bit there are a few nuances as far as as how how the technology works. And and sometimes we're 
introducing them to new technology um, on our on our devices that they can take advantage of. Uh, particularly if, if they used to use whiteboards, um, we have to other tools that they can use in, um, in place of that. So so our, our rooms are pretty much scheduled out pretty much from 8:30 to 5 or so every day, and mm-hmm. you, um, we actually have free control over over our three rooms that. Uh, space management has actually allowed us to, to take control of those rooms. So I work with space management, and I work with the, the 12 departments to, to schedule classes for those for those spaces. And there's there's probably growing competition because they're starting to get uh, more more classes online, and 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 more departments are taking advantage of that. And and there there's some like I mean, like I said, we have six six degree programs. So we really want to focus to make sure we we had those classes, but uh, but but yeah, it's so it's 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 busy and and uh, it, it keeps us going. Colleen, in your context, I suspect that your engagement and outreach was more along the lines of um, how to pedagogically integrate the res- the collection tools that you've um, been building around into different types of problems. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. I've, I've got the opportunity to work uh, one-on-one with the instructors of the courses that match the labs that we're implementing the smartphone usage in. Um, so I've been able to go and meet with them on a one-to-one basis and show them how the app works, and some have really shown an interest in actually talking about it in class. So it's another tie-in. It's yet yet another tie-in um, to what students are seeing outside of the lab experience. Excellent, excellent. So, so John, I mean, it sounds to me like your space has been um, uh, a wild success, and um, and that at the in the in introductory phases of it, you may have had to done some particularly focused outreach in order to um, bring the move from the early adopters, the ones who were closely working with you in the planning stages, to a broader audience. Is there uh, perhaps a transition to that wider audience that you've had to focus on? Well, let's say at least that it wasn't an abject failure. I mean, uh, <laughs> education isn't really a science, no matter how we like to think about it. It, it just it isn't yet. Um, and so the real principle is do no harm. It's more like it's more like medicine than anything. Um, and so we we find that the the students' grades are um, you know consistent with prior rooms, and so we're not seeing a harm effect. We're not we're not measuring a downside um, with the faculty themselves. Well, we're still in the kind of traditional mode of the registrar picks by the number of you know students and so on. But this has fundamentally changed the way we think about how to allocate these rooms. Um, and and so now what what I'm working on is a way to tie the pedagogical um, uh, intentions through the object course objectives, the learning objectives, as a way that we could actually tie it to how to um, assign a room. That there has to be an intentional, yes, I am going to teach in a way that uses this space effectively. And that's important because if you look at the literature of learning spaces research, um, in higher ed, there's been almost no attention paid to the physicality of space. Uh, K-12, much more, but not in higher ed. And so I think we're just on the verge here with all of these instances that we're hearing of folks here of really being intentional about the dynamics and dimensions of the space that we teach in. That's going to mean different ways of organizing who does what, when, where, and how. So I would urge you to, to publish in the one journal that I do know in that space, the Journal of Learning Spaces, um, which is the University of North Carolina um, a publication um, to get the academic uh, contributions out there. Um, and the one theme, before I turn it back to Alex, because I know you're going to want to wrap this up in a, just a minute or two, um, that I heard, which was kind of interesting um, across all of you, and that is this con- the connection between the space that you focused on and its surround. In the context of, um, uh, of the, um, the, the space that you have, John, you described um, that you've got this core area where those classrooms and the surround and the circular spaces are, but you've got this large, almost apron-like uh, expanse of spaces for students to gather uh, or do various specific kinds of interactions. Um, in the context of Colleen's environment, um, the surround, interestingly enough, is the campus and sometimes perhaps off the campus. And so um, and so the surround is actually um, 
flexible and and and, tran and transforming depending on the particular needs that your experiment um, imposes. That's right. Um, in fact, and in we, even, case, we, we try to underline the fact that physics is everywhere, and so the fact that it's a mobile device, it's, it's kind of a nice way to, to get ourselves... To make that uh, real. That's right, right, exactly. And in the case of, uh, of the Oklahoma's library, that's a, that has an effect um, taken over in many sense, it sounds like, the, uh, the perception of the library. And so um, you had the, uh, the luxury of doing more than just one space, and so you could think about the interactions among the spaces um, and have more formal, less formal, um, in, you know, and, and group spaces that are accordingly uh, organized. But you're now finding yourself in, inserted into the campus tour, so you're becoming part of the larger campus whether you meant to or not. Um, so, Alex, it sounds like we've gotten a variety of, of possibilities for people to consider from um, the campus in your pocket or the learning space in your pocket to um, a formal um, uh, space that allows the external students to participate um, f formally with classrooms in the, in the distance learning environment, and then a variety of very different um, purpose-built um, uh, learning spaces, some for direct instruction in the context of Oregon State, um, but they also have this lovely surround to it, and then some for more informal spaces and exploration in the case of the University of Oklahoma. Um, so I'll turn it back to you, Alex, and, and give you um, the last few minutes. All right. Well, thanks, Phil. Uh, to wrap up today's program, I want to thank uh, Phil and panelists Philip, Colleen, John, and Carl on behalf of the NMC for taking time to join today's discussion on how universities are rethinking their learning spaces. Um, participants, well, this is the end of the program, but not the end of questions, if you happen to have any. Um, if you have anything about uh, what you heard or saw today, let me know by contacting me directly at alex at nmc.org, and I'll get in touch with you with whatever that information is, get you the answers. Um, to learn more about NMC Beyond the Horizon programs, and to get involved in our community, please visit our website at nmc.org. Like us on Facebook or, or follow us on Twitter at nmc.org. And with that, I want to thank you all for joining us today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your summer break if you have one. Uh, get out to the pool, get out to the uh, mountains, wherever, whatever uh, makes you happy. Uh, I hope, hope you spend some time doing that this summer. All right, thank you. Until next time. <laughs> so thank you all very much. Appreciate it.